firstly, uh, Mr. Gates, thank you so much for that, that incredible clarity of thought. Uh, it was really insightful. We learned a lot. Um, thank you for your charity, firstly. That's, you know, I think the world's a better place because of that. So I think if we can give one sort of acknowledgement. Um, and I think thank you for your optimism that you painted. Uh, you were right in putting the asterisk because that was as a news person coming in my mind as you were speaking. Um, so, so, so thank you for the optimism. I guess, you know, I think my, my, my question is what are the obstacles to making this all happen? Is, it, is technology the obstacle? Is it resources? Is it just human focus, human will, political will, human focus? What is the, what's that one thing that you think is the, sort of holding us back to make these innovations happen faster? Because certainly the problems are only, you know, getting larger and larger. Well, we certainly have a challenge that the places where you have the resources and the ability to you know, give money or help use science to solve these problems is often very distant from where the problem is. Uh, you know, so for example, the suffering of malaria, if the people in literally who live near you, you know, were uh, yeah. the ones who were having those problems, you would probably buy bed nets for them. Uh, and you would try and advocate for a research program to bring that horrible disease to an end, which hopefully we will. Even within India, you know, the places, places with the toughest challenge are far away uh, from where you have the most sophistication. I'd always hoped that the digital tools would essentially shrink distance and make us understand what people are doing and have more humanity. And we've seen some of that. We've also seen that you get to kind of draw in to your own ideas. And so it's also been a force for polarization. And you have this struggle of, does it make us more uh, find what's going wrong with our fellow man and see what's going well? Or do we just you know, go into often some non-factual uh, dead ends uh, that uh, sort of pit, pit people against each other. So, in, so, so you are acknowledging that there are conflicts globally, I mean, in solving these issues. There are very real conflicts. I mean, I, you know, I live in Mumbai, we were just discussing that. I don't think any major city in the world is building a metro in the year 2023, right? Building a metro from scratch. So we are, you know, we, we, and we need to do this. Uh, we have to invest in that. Do you think the solutions, therefore, will be much more localized and customized to India's needs, or will they be global solutions then? Well, it'll certainly be a mix. I mean, the really key technologies, like the green way of making cement, the green way of making steel, you know, can you power jet planes with hydrogen uh, instead of with you know, hydrocarbons? Those technologies will uh, get invented and competed on a very global basis. You know, there's not a country that's not talking about green hydrogen as something that they want to bring into their economy because it, it actually solves a lot of these different climate things. But the path you go about it uh, will have to be local. So, for example, the, this grid, this gigantic green grid, uh, you know, for India, you're actually kind of blessed because you have a, a fair bit of wind, a fair bit of solar, and so you'll solve it in a certain way. For a country like Japan, it's very difficult. Yeah. They don't have the same land mass. Uh, and so hopefully for them, some form of nuclear will be both economic and safe and acceptable for them. Uh, because otherwise, you know, they kind of face a dilemma. Do they want to depend on other countries for their energy supply? Uh, uh, and, uh, but to be green, yeah. It's a particular challenge that varies country by country. The U.S. is very lucky. We're a gigantic country. Yep. And so even if the wind's not blowing in the Midwest, it's blowing somewhere. You know, even if it's not sunny uh, in one location, it's sunny somewhere. So if we build a, a big enough grid, we can draw. And actually, we you know, trust Canada enough to make it more of a uh, North American project okay. instead of just, just the United States. The problems that we're talking about and that we're facing, does it, I mean, do you ever think about the fact that, um, you know, a lot of it is coming from a vision of development, a vision of life, uh, you know, a picture and that, that was kind of painted by the West? So, you know, especially when you talk about India, uh, you know, you have people who say that, you know, we've been actually living a fairly 
sustainable life. I mean, our lifestyle is fairly sustainable in India. But this, the ambition, the American dream, which is now the world's dream, it's all of our dreams, you know, that, that picture got painted somewhere uh, in the West. Do you, do you think about that fact that the, maybe? Well, I don't think we can count on people living a impoverished lifestyle as a solution to climate. Right. Um, and yes, you know, meat consumption in India will be less. That's good for your health, you know, that's wonderful. Will all Indians become vegetarians? Will all Americans become vegetarians? I wouldn't want to count on it. Anybody who wants to evangelize that, they're w welcome to, I won't resist yeah. in any way. And so yes, in, cli in climate movements, you can kind of get this, hey, we've been consuming too much, and hey, maybe we shouldn't travel anymore. Um, that, you know, reducing demand, in the rich countries, you know, the US in particular, we could use half as much energy yes. per person. But in, if we said to India to stay at your current level, that would be completely un, unjust. Yes. Uh, and so most of the demand for more energy, more cement, more steel, uh, is coming from middle-income countries yes. like India, where even if you stop at, say, a quarter of American energy intensity, the climate change is very, very dramatic. Yeah. And so, you know, I'm not saying, hey, consume as much as possible, but we ought to give people that option. You know, take, for example, air conditioning. Yes. Uh, if you're tough, you know, don't buy air conditioning. Uh, it's good for the climate if you, you know, sleep in hot weather. But as India gets warmer and warmer, I'm betting the demand yes. for air conditioning yes. is going to skyrocket. The country that has the most air conditioning by far is the United States. Uh, even Europe doesn't have what we have. And, and so as it gets hotter, you, know, you demand more electricity, which if it's not green, then you're in a, a, a positive feedback loop. Sure. And all the innovations that are going to solve these problems, that, and that we've spoken about a lot of them, I mean, such lovely examples you've dug out from India itself. Um, but there is this kind of idea, and this, this, this thought that the innovation you know, there, there is one sort of realm of the school of thought which says that you need to incentivize innovation, you need to incentivize R&D, and so make it commercially viable for people to invest time and effort in R&D. And there's an opposing school of thought which says, you know, once you've invented something, such, you know, which is going to solve the world's problems, you know, share it. Don't, 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 don't be exploitative, don't be, uh, you know, don't, don't, don't make it expensive. Especially in healthcare, this comes up a lot. Uh, how do you, how do you, what, what's your prescription for that? sharing of technology that's going to help the world? Well, in healthcare, we do have a solution that's kind of ideal, uh, which is that the return that allows drug companies to have profit uh, comes to them primarily from their sales in the rich countries and somewhat from middle-income countries. And that uh, for lower-income countries, uh, the price should be just what it costs to make the medicine. In fact, you know, because the, these countries either uh, don't enforce the patents or people don't even yeah. file the patents, and now the pharmaceutical companies understand the expectation. So you know, the foundation has helped create a patent pooling mechanism. Uh, and we were talking to the generic drug manufacturers here in India who go to that yeah. and actually make incredibly low-cost medicines. Yeah. And so you know, we help them, their profit margins are low enough that sometimes we have to grant them money or guarantee them volume so they can afford the investment to bring the price down uh, because it, it, it is a low margin business. So this tiered pricing approach works very well in medicine. Most climate technologies, I do think market competition will make the price as people are seeking volume from these things. Uh, it'll make it very low, but you know, if there's some key climate technology that only uh, one person has, then the political process about, okay, you know, which country should really pay uh, for this uh, and have that intellectual property, something will kick in uh, because climate is a global problem. In fact, it's a problem that is worst in the countries that have, have the toughest challenge. Right. And so I don't think we have to a priority say that the market won't solve these things. I think we can sit there and say if the market isn't driving the availability uh, of great solutions, then yes, government will step in. Do you think Big Pharma needs a brand makeover in developing countries then? Or? Um, 
big pharma has done a lot of incredible invention. You know, like there's now a new class and there's a lot coming of obesity drugs. So I'm not going to stick up for everything big, yeah. big pharma yeah. does. Yeah. Some of this pricing stuff is very complicated. Right. But overall, yes, I think the fact that they hire smart young people, you know, they run $500 million Alzheimer's drug trials. All of those have been failures to this point, and yet there they are, you know, continuing to try that. So I wouldn't want to get rid of the profit motive in medical innovation altogether. Okay. Is there a pricing system better than the one, certainly in the U.S.? Uh, yes, and the, the bill that's mostly known as a climate bill, the IRA bill, actually has some very complicated but probably very helpful pricing reform uh, for pharmaceuticals in the United States. Just a, a little bit about nuclear energy. You know, does it frustrate you about where it is right now? You know, the, I, mean, I know that you've invested in companies that are working in that space. Uh, the previous party that was running this, that was in government, almost staked its whole, whole reputation and, and government for nuclear energy. Uh, but somehow, uh, you know, it doesn't. W where do you see nuclear energy fitting in? in what happened with nuclear energy is that, unlike computers where the prices kept going down, the complexity of the nuclear reactors kept going up. And so by the time that they got to what we have today, as it's called third generation, they really priced themselves out of the market. Uh, the overruns, you know, the cost were just incredible. Yeah. And then cheap natural gas came in and made it very tough. And so the nuclear industry didn't invent a new design. What's necessary is to start from scratch and to do a bit different of a reactor. Now, I'm very biased on this. I have over a billion dollars in a company doing this, and, you know, it could fail. And I'm only, I'm not doing it to make money. I'm doing it because it may contribute to the climate uh, issue. So there's nuclear fission, that there'll be a new generation of designs that I, will be dramatically cheaper and safer. Then there's nuclear fusion. Yes. Um, I'm actually an investor at a lower scale in uh, four of about 16 companies uh, that are, seem to be making some progress there. We can't count on it. Yep. Uh, there's a few of them that say in 10 to 15 years, if everything went perfectly, uh, they think they could make cheap electricity. And so that, you know, we have to keep an open mind that will nuclear fission solve its problems with nuclear fusion come into existence. It would be great for humanity if those solutions worked well. Uh, now, you know, technologists have often overpromised in terms of schedules yep. or various things. So it's, it's fine for people to be skeptical, but I'm one of the people uh, trying to drive both of those forward so that as these climate, as the climate damage gets worse, we have as many options as possible to build this new energy system. And nuclear, because it's not weather dependent, it's very nice yes. if you can mix that in. I mean, I'm the biggest fan of building solar and wind as fast as you can. Uh, build more grid as fast as you can. That is super good, and it's really great to see India, you know, yeah. the, the, the curve is really um, kicking in, and some of the, the big companies are now teaming up with the small companies and announcing breathtaking uh, projects. And the, and the price of that energy is actually comparable, if not cheaper, than sometimes the Yeah, if storage. you get up to very high percentage renewable, you know, where you have no coal plants, no natural gas plants, the reliability issue is very hard. And so yeah. Um, yeah. I'm funding some open source software so that uh, institutions all over the world, including some in India, can look at your future grid and say, okay, what mix will allow us, you know, during different periods of year, the wind uh, and the sun varies a lot. And so the, so, some of the times where you want the most energy is when it would be generated. Yeah. So anyway, engineers will work on that yeah. uh, problem, but the, anything you do in renewables, you'll be glad that yeah. you did. We should get to artificial intelligence, because that's the big question everybody has. You know, just, I mean, we couldn't get a better oracle than you to talk about this. You know, how do you see this playing out? Just, and, 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 and you know, are we ready for it? <laughs> we may never be ready. Uh, the, you know, the dream, it, it, for, as somebody who grew up thinking about software and what software could do and not do, you know, AI was always the dream. And how is it that humans are so good at, recognizing images and recognizing speech. And even, you know, say five years ago, things like image recognition or speech recognition had gotten very good. So it's kind of your peripheral senses yeah. 
the machine was uh, at human or even slightly better levels, but it could not read. It could memorize the document so you could say what's on page 34, but if you said, hey, you know, pass this complex biology test about this biology textbook, it, ne it just couldn't do it. And what's amazing is that these, the current AI work, these large language models that are called general predictors, they now are showing they can read and they can write. They're not perfect, yep. but you know, for anybody who's played, even with chat GPT-3, you, you'll sometimes get answers that stun you how stupid the thing is, and you'll sometimes get answers like, whoa, that is so fluent and so creative. I mean, it's spooky, and you know, I'm playing with something even better uh, than that, and believe me, it's even spookier. Uh, uh, and mostly in a positive way. I mean, I, you know, people are surprised. Now I can write poems that are uh, <laughs> rhyme, rhyme very well and songs and greetings. And so it, we're at the beginning of computers that help in ways that they never could before. Right. And I think the pace of innovation will be very rapid. Uh, you know, and so I've gone to full day meetings where we sit and talk about, okay, in healthcare, how do we use this to find more drugs, to give advice to patients? I've gone to a full day thing uh, you know, with Microsoft, OpenAI, yeah. and foundation people where we talk about education. Can we make a tutor that knows your level of understanding and understands your motivation? Yeah. And so that you know, if you like sports examples or medical examples, it's doing it that way. And so it, this is the biggest thing happening in tech. I mean, yeah. yes, we'll you know, have 3D glasses and everything, but this is way more profound because the productivity of even white collar jobs now uh, is being uh, greatly enhanced yeah. over the next two or three years.